Today on the Ask Brady Show, we talk about the legalities and best practices of shooting photos in your church and the seven things you need to consider. Well, hey there, Pro Church Nation, and welcome to the Ask Brady Show, episode number 24. We've got four great questions from the people of Pro Church Nation, and I'm joined, as always, to my left, your right, it's Roxanne. It's true. True it is, behind the camera, the editing wizard himself, Joe Nex. And the man with the cam, Alex Mills. Thanks. It's not really as special as it sounds because I work here, but I'm here. Great. Well, Roxanne, why don't you kick us off with the very first question? Sure. The first question comes from Adam, and he sent in a video question. Hey, Brady, I just listened to the podcast where you interviewed uh, Alex Mills about photos, and you said how important that photos were for the church. Um But my question is about, like, the legalities of taking photos of people and posting it on social media and putting it all over your website. Like, do we have to get talent release forms of everybody in the church? Um, Because we're taking pictures of all these people. Like, how is that legal? Like, is that legit to do? So that's my question. Sorry for my appearance. I uh, just got done mowing my lawn. That's when I listen to you. Great question, Adam. This is something that a lot of churches consider. And so there are a variety of different things that you should be thinking about when it comes to taking photos in your church. The first and most important thing is, and I will say this with the caveat that I am not a lawyer and this is not legal advice. Uh, So make that disclaimer very, very clear. But anytime you do any research on this, both from articles that I've seen written and, you know, when I've looked into the actual laws and laws do differ from state to state, country to country, shooting photos in a public place is basically fair game. This is kind of the most important thing that you need to know. So for instance, if you are in a public place, such as a street or on a sidewalk and you're shooting there, you're good. Um, And even if you're shooting in a public place and shooting private property from the public place, so for instance, if you're, you know, in the suburbs and you're shooting videos and there are some houses in the background, you're good. Uh, Last year, a couple of us were out shooting in a neighborhood. There was this big Christmas tree in the center of the neighborhood. And so we were shooting there, capturing some footage. This lady walks out and says, you can't shoot here. And this is when you need to obviously use tact and be kind and be charitable. But the lady was wrong. We had 100% uh, right to be there, and there was nothing she could do to get us off. Now, we obviously don't want to be mean to her, unkind. She was an elderly old lady, and she thought it was weird that young teenagers, not teenagers, <laughs> were shooting in her suburb. She's like, you can't shoot my house. Stop documenting me and putting it on the interwebs. So, you know, we had to talk, uh, talk through that with her. So public is fair game. And with that being said, you know, a church property, especially inside a building, is not technically public property. It's owned by somebody. But if it's your public property, there, uh, sorry, if it's your property, there is a legality for you shooting there as well. Now, there is one kind of caveat generally to be considered when you're shooting in public property or property where crowds are gathered, where, you know, people are allowed to go publicly. And that is People do have a reasonable right to privacy. And there could be an argument made that when you're in a worship service, as intimate as it is, especially if you're, you know, raised hands in worship or prayer, that that is a moment where people should have their own right to privacy. Now, not every person would agree with that, and that would be up for interpretation, but that is something to consider. Generally, though, if you're shooting in a building that you own where uh, crowds are gathering publicly, you can shoot and you're fine. Now, beyond that, just because something's legal doesn't mean it's 100% right or ethical or moral. So let's talk about some other considerations to make. There are things that you can do to make sure that people are comfortable. The first foremost is that you can put signs on doors that just say, make a disclaimer like I did that I am not a lawyer, make a disclaimer that, hey, just so you know, video and or photos will be taken during this. So people are aware of that. Mm -hmm. To take it to another level, you can actually kind of have a certain area within your auditorium that you designate as a spot where people can sit where they know they are not going to be filmed or photographed. So for instance, if you're doing a live stream, this would also apply. You're doing crowd shots and stuff like that. It doesn't have to be something super formal. I mean, you could just do something where it's like the back row on the right hand like section of the pews or the back row of chairs in the center section. Like, you know, we're not going to shoot there. You probably don't want to do it in the center section because, you know, that might be a place where you get kind of some 
you know, ambient shots either way, but you know, you could tuck it away in the corner sort of thing. So that way people know they're being photographed with the signs on the doors and then they have the choice to kind of withdraw themselves from photographic candidacy and sit in a place where they are not going to have their likeness captured on videos or photos. Another thing that you should probably also be aware of and just be okay with is expect and be prepared to delete photos. So if you post something on social, if you post something, you know, on your website and someone does come to you, Roxanne comes to you and says, look, I just, I don't want my photo up there. Just kind of have an expectation and preparedness that you might have to delete a photo at any time. And if it was me, I would rather delete a photo, even though if technically I was allowed to shoot it and use it, mm-hmm. then upset somebody, right? And this yeah. is where, again, the, the boundaries of legality and just, you know, best practice are going to cross. Sure, technically, legally, you were allowed to shoot that photo. And there's nothing Roxanne can do legally. She's not going to sue you. But you don't want to piss off Roxanne. I've seen her upset. It's terrifying. It doesn't happen that often. And if you've upset her over a photo, not worth it. Delete it. So just be kind of prepared and aware ahead of time that that may happen eventually. And if you shoot enough photos of people, it will happen inevitably at some point. When it comes to minors, always get their permission before shooting. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to your kid's ministry, have release forms that are signed. You could have them on record. Um... Make sure that you are not using a photo of a minor without permission. That's kind of really best practice. And it's even better to get their permission before you shoot a photo. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, most people aren't going to be too upset if you're capturing, you know, their own likeness, especially in the world of social media. We're putting our own likeness on display at all times, basically. You might have some older people that are upset, but that, you know, is going to continue to become less and less. But when it comes to minors, you know, parents might not be super thrilled if you're taking photos of their kids without their prior consent. So be considerate of that. Final thing is when it comes to high traffic photos, meaning the main photo at the top of your website, the main video at the top of your website. Uh, If you're doing an advertising campaign, whether it be on Facebook, whether it be a print campaign, when you're using a photo that is going to be seen again and again, high traffic, it might be best to get the permission of the people or person in the photo ahead of time just to make sure they're good with it. You know, it's highly unlikely in in churches of most sizes that you're going to get a picture of someone posted on social and someone's going to get really upset. Highly unlikely. Meaning if you do it a hundred times, it might happen once. Mm -hmm. But if you're using that photo at the very top of your website, if you're using that photo in a postcard that gets sent out to 25,000 homes in your neighborhood. If you use that photo on a Facebook ads campaign that reaches 300,000 people in your city, suddenly these high traffic photos, the more they are seen by individuals, the more likely you are to upset somebody. And if you've already put in the sign on the auditorium, you have a section in your church where people don't care. If you have a church that's just laid back and is not full of elderly people that are just a bit uppity, then you're probably fine there too. What I'm trying to do with this answer is kind of give you every possible angle that I can think of when it comes to shooting photos, the legalities, and the best practices. Mm -hmm. So to summarize, I had seven points. Always choose an odd number for the amount of points you have. Sounds better. Seven points. Number one, most important. When you're shooting in a public place or where crowds are gathered, which is considered a public place, it's fair game. You shouldn't have a problem legally. The only caveat to that, point number two, is people do have a respectable right to privacy. So there could be an argument made that an intimate moment like prayer or worship is considered that and that wouldn't be cool. And to that end, this is where if you're using like a really close-up shot of someone, you know, if you've got a camera with a 200 millimeter lens and you're shooting someone mid-hand, you know, maybe shoot someone that you know will be chill, not someone you recognize as a new visitor. You know, that might be something to consider. Uh, Three, Signs on doors are always great for making that disclaimer so people are aware of what may be happening. Number four, you could create a section in your church, just, you know, the back row in one of the sections in the corner where you have decided you will not film. Number five, be prepared to delete photos. Number six, always get permission from and for minors. And number seven, consider getting permission on high traffic photos, even if they aren't of minors, that they're going to be seen by thousands upon thousands of people. What you wouldn't want to do is print 25,000 postcards and then get somebody upset knowing that you could not delete it and backtrack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm actually really glad Adam asked this question because we get it a lot. So it's good to finally have it out in one place to share with people. (laughs) Agreed. All right. The next question comes from Jared and he also sent in a video. Hey Brady, I can't tell you how much uh, you and pro church tools have made an impact in my life and which impacts the church's creatives and which ultimately impacts the kingdom, which is awesome. And I've always known what looks good, but now I understand more of the why and what I'm doing. 
So I kind of have a two-part question, but related to the same. Uh, as a main church creative, how do I help the kids ministry not look cheesy? Like when the pastor wants a post on social media and wants to promote an event. And so for this event, uh, he asked for like bubbly fonts and curved letters and other looks that I find to look strange. It seems like it doesn't belong on social media, but what, but we do want to reach families and their kids, like through their kids. But the main demographic also is to reach the 20s and 30s. And I understand that like these kids aren't going to be on social media. Are they going to be watching their parents as they're scrolling through? Or, I don't know. So like, who do you appeal to when you make those posts too? And then also, we are a church that hasn't launched yet. So some things in the kids' ministry aren't set visual and style-wise. Like they're looking for uh, a logo. And I know the pastor is going to want a different font, probably bubbly, and treat the kids' ministry as a sub-brand, as a sub-brand. But at least it will be called something normal, like it'll be the name of church kids. But then you go deeper in each of the names of the classrooms are going to have their own unique names, like the unicorn class or whatever. I just made that up. That's not real. But something like that, you know. And uh, so would that be like, where would the line be in being consistent and the branding overall with the whole church? Well, thanks for the kind words and the question, Jared. You know, this there's a lot of moving parts in your question. So I want to start with the most important is that as we've talked about in the past, you know, you want to be a branded house, not a house of brands. The average church, 200 or less, your church could be even bigger. But organizations where 200 people attend a church service, they don't need dozens of different brands or even multiple brands. Churches have enough trouble figuring out a single brand, much mm -hmm. less managing multiple. And again, churches often have this inclination, this compulsion to add more and more and more rather than make hard decisions and go run in a single lane feels like well, if we do lots of different things, maybe we have a chance of one of them hitting, which doesn't really work when you're an individual, sorry, an organization that has such limited resources. It makes sense to make a good decision in one place and run in that single lane. That's how you win with communication. With that being said, it sounds like you're on the right track when it comes to the name of your kids' ministry. So if your church was Engaged Church, you'd want to have Engaged Kids. What you'd also want to do is have the same logo for that though and the same font. So if you're name of your church, Engaged Church, is written in, you know, Proxima Nova font, you'd also want Engaged Kids to be written in Proxima Nova font as well. It doesn't really make much sense to be consistent with the actual sound of the name if you're also not consistent with that, uh, with the way the, the name actually appears visually. You'd want the logo and the typeface to be identical as well. You want to be consistent with your consistency. If you're inconsistent with your goal of being consistent, you're still being inconsistent. Right. Is that clear? I, I think I got it. Awesome. Okay, so that would be the first big point. Second thing, when it comes to bubbly fonts, when it comes to colors, you mentioned the different demographics that your church is trying to reach. What's also interesting is if you're doing a promotion for a kid's ministry, right? Not like an internal thing when it comes to a, a slide in your church necessarily, but an outreach when it comes to Facebook ads, a mailer, anywhere, even on your website or within your existing congregation. Who is going to be seeing this promotion? Not the seven-year-old kid, mm -hmm. the parents are. And so really, the best way to promote something like this is with photos. That is what's going to grab the attention most of someone scrolling through, perusing through their social feed or through their mail or through the church's website. What you want to do is promote to the people that are making the decision on this event. And the six-year-old, the seven-year-old, the eight-year-old is not the one that's making the decision to attend the VBS, to attend the movie night right? It's the parents. So you might want to consider creating actual material to reach the parents. And to that end, that material would be the same brand wise as what you're doing on your website already. And that's an easy way to stay consistent. It might be an easy way to convince your pastor to be like, look, a kid is not going to see this bubbly font and be like, you know what? I have decided to drive out to this event to be a part of it because they can't. The reason that television shows and kids' toys are using super bright colors and maybe bubbly fonts, though I would say that's up for debate, is because a kid has a choice over which television program they watch. Mm -hmm. They do not have the choice, to the same extent, to jump in a car and attend a VBS or to pay the $10 for the registration for the big kids' event that you're hosting, right? And so 
advertising to the parents, and and this is a this is an ongoing kind of debate, argument, decision making process when it comes to anything that's related to marketing to kids. Yes, kids are becoming younger and younger when it comes to their availability, and the and the the phone, our mobile devices, makes. It's so that we can market directly to kids, but there are tons of laws around that. And so even big brands, the discussion is always, are we marketing to the kids or to the parents? Mm -hmm. And it's likely both, but how do we figure out you know, the, the intersection between those? Another thing to consider when it comes to bubbly fonts is if your pastor, if your leader is adamant on using a special fun kind of kids brand for this event and this for the, the visual assets for this advertisement, there are ways that you can get around this. You know, I've had a plenty. I've had plenty of conversations, somewhat surprisingly, when a church has come to me and said, "My pastor thinks papyrus font is awesome." I know it's not, but how do I explain that? Because a pastor does not really necessarily care if you say, "Well, a bunch of designers think the papyrus is dumb." Now, there are ways to get around that, but the easy solution when it comes to convincing leadership, which is the dynamic that we're trying to navigate here, is finding an alternative. Mm. So, what you want to do is get to the why of your pastor's desire to use a bubbly font or papyrus. You'd be like, okay, why do you want this? So in the papyrus instance, pastors are usually like, well, when I look at papyrus, I look, it feels like, you know, Sanskrit. It feels like, uh, you know, a form of scripting, the way the Bible would be manuscript. You're like, great, if that's the reason why, I'm gonna find a font that feels like that. Now the pastor, they were just scrolling through Microsoft Word and saw something that they thought was cool. They don't know all of the baggage that's attached to papyrus. They're not a designer. And again, this is one of these symptoms of churches being organizations with very limited resources. You have people that are serving in roles that they should not be, but they need to be because who else is gonna do it? So what you wanna do is get to the root. Why does my pastor wanna use this cartoony font? He thinks it will appeal to kids or parents and thus appeal to their kids. Okay, great. Go to a place like creativemarket.com where designers are creating tremendous fonts and find a font that is kids-like using the search, using the categories, using like a way to refine and, and find a font that feels kidsy. Show your pastor, right? And then that way he's not gonna allow you to use like the 3D rendering engine in Microsoft Word Perfect where you could kind of create those like bubbly fonts that look 3D and you did yep. it for your like your grade eight project and you're like, this looks sweet. Because <laughs> it probably did in grade eight or at least you thought it did. Yep. That's a way where you don't have to like, you don't wanna lose... Look, you really don't want to fight a battle for a font, probably. So if your leadership is so adamant on using a certain type of font, they probably don't care if you use papyrus or one that accomplishes the same why, that is an alternative, that is still, you know, matching what they want, kind of the same style. So don't, like, you don't want to lose a battle or make your battle, make your final stand for fonts. It's just not worth it. Yeah. So what you want to do is navigate a substitute, an alternative. So what you need to do is get to the why of your pastor's goal here. Why do they want a bubbly font? Oh, they want to appeal to kids. They want to appeal to parents of kids. Okay, great. Let's find an alternative that looks good. Like you said, Jared, you know it looks good. So go to Creative Market, find a font that looks good, but is a substitute adequate for what your pastor, what your senior leadership is trying to accomplish with this brand. Yeah, sounds good. All right. Question three comes from Bob. And he says, um, I'm the communications director for my church. I'm wondering what you would recommend as a policy regarding pinning posts on my church's Facebook page. Occasionally, a staff person with admin rights will pin something to our Facebook page that I don't believe warrants pinning. However, I don't have a standing policy or best practice, so I don't feel it would be appropriate to tell the person they shouldn't pin. Wondering if you have any suggested best practices. So your Facebook page will allow you to pin a post to the very top. Facebook's algorithm, even within groups and within pages sometimes, will kind of change the order, right? Or if it doesn't change the order and the order shows up in a chronological fashion, a post that might be very uh, very important to you or very popular can get buried very quickly by other posts mm -hmm. that aren't as important or as popular. So Facebook gives you this option. Uh, Twitter gives you this same option on your individual profile to take a tweet or take a post and pin it to the top. Meaning when someone visits, and this is the key, when someone, when someone visits your Facebook page or when someone visits your Twitter profile, the first thing they see will be this pinned post. With that being said, this only works for people that visit your page. Yeah. Now, we don't know the way that the algorithms of social work. That is the mystery. So the more I thought about this, the more I thought maybe there's the chance that if you pin a post, Facebook will give it a little bit extra boost in reach. Oh, but sure. if you're pinning a post, 
likely, or at least half the time, you're pinning it because it's performed well or because it's important and it's already kind of done its run through the organic reach that mm-hmm. you're going to get. And so pinning it, even if it did give it an extra boost in organic reach, wouldn't really merit that decision because the post has already run its course. Right. So you got to consider that the only people that are going to see this pin post, the only people that it matters for are those that are going out of their way to visit your Facebook page, not seeing your posts within their feed. This is a very small group of people, Mm -hmm. maybe half a dozen a week, maybe a dozen a week if you're a huge church, a bigger church. People don't just go out of their way to look to your page. You, the staff, the admins of the page, you are visiting the page a lot. I see the Pro Church Tools Facebook page all the time. When was the last time you saw it? You might have seen my posts in your feed, but you're not going out of your way to facebook.com slash Pro Church Tools, though if you haven't liked it already, go do that. That's the thing though. Once you've liked the page, you've got no reason to go back to the page. So it's probably not that big of a deal fighting over this. The bigger issue is who has admin rights to your social platforms. This is a discussion that we had on a podcast interview that I did just this week coming out. I think it's coming out in August with Kenny Jang where we were talking about it's very important to consider who has admin rights, Mm -hmm. who has 100% autonomous decision-making ability on your social platforms. And I kind of compared it to the stage at your church. You would not be okay if someone in the middle of service, whether a congregation member or someone on staff, just walked onto the stage, was like, look, I know we're in the middle of the second song, but before we jump to the third, I've got something to say. And then just said their piece. Hey, men's ministry, it's going to be big. There's going to be bacon. (laughs) Jim, get off the stage, right? Like, Now, if you talk to, if Jim came to you beforehand, this is what would happen, right? Maybe you've got no problem with Jim making a stage announcement, but he's going to come to the senior leadership beforehand. You're going to discuss how it works. And yet with social, we don't yet have that kind of best practice, approval rate, uh, approval process, or even just assumption. People are like, I had something I wanted to post, so I posted it. That's the problem. So, there are different ways to kind of deal with this. One way to, would be to limit the admin rights and just have one or two people have administrative access, posting access, editors access, and then having them kind of be the gatekeepers over social. With that being said, if you can't do that and people are pinning posts left, right, and center, it's probably not that big of a deal. Though, when I'm thinking about what posts would be pinnable uh, with a church's Facebook account... I think one good one would be, you know, your church's weekly service. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're doing a video of your service, a live stream of your service on Facebook Live, it might be smart to just pin that. What kind of posts are you pinning on your Facebook page? The type of posts that you want to be seen and that are kind of like, you know, ongoing sort of things. There aren't too many events that I think will be pinnable. Maybe if you had a huge registration where the deadline was coming soon, that might be pinnable, pin worthy. But I think the, probably the best use of that pinned position, the amount of words I'm saying that start with P right now, <laughs> that pinned <laughs> position of the post would be your church's weekly service. That's my best thoughts. Yeah. All right. Final question comes from Josh. And he says, social media posting templates. Should we post the same theme across all our platforms on the same day or not correlate the themes between platforms each day? Was he talking about theme, like con- like subject matter or medium? Um, both. Okay, great. So I'll respond to both. So when it comes to subject matter, I mean, the underlying concept here, and I like how each question that we've done so far kind of has like this macro idea. And then once you've got that managed kind of micro implications for that macro idea. The macro idea here is if you're posting the same content on Facebook as you are Instagram, as you are Twitter, why am I following you on all three? Mm -hmm. You've got to give me a reason to follow you on multiple platforms if that's your goal. If that's not your goal, then post the same stuff. If your goal is just you assume that only 25-year-olds are on Instagram and only 30-plus-year-olds or on Facebook, and only college and high school kids are on Twitter, then post the exact same stuff on every single platform, and that's fine. But because we know that's not reality, and people are on multiple different platforms, you've got to give them a reason to follow you on each unique platform. So that means posting different content. Now, there are so many different ways that you can create different content. You don't need all of your subject matter to be unique every single day on three different platforms. You don't need the medium that you post, meaning the video whether that be 16 by nine, one by one, or the photo, or the text, or the link post. You don't need that to be different every single time, every single day, on every single platform. You've got so many variables that you're working with, just to run through a few. 
Type of medium, meaning video or photo. Aspect ratio. Subject matter. Time of day. Length of post. That's just five that I think I thought of right there. And each one of those has multiple within them. So like subject matter, that means you've got like 10 different categories within that. Medium, there are like six different options within that. And the more variables that you have, and easily it's two dozen, three dozen, the number of combinations between these variables now becomes basically infinite. So here's what we do when it comes to different social platforms. We abide by the best practices, by the accepted culture of each social, pla- uh, each social platform. So for instance, video right now, vi- video right now, Facebook right now, video is going to be the best thing to post. Instagram stills are still the best thing to post. Twitter, short, 140 character less or words, still the best thing to post. Now that doesn't mean that I won't use a video on Instagram. That doesn't mean that I won't use a photo on Facebook. And that doesn't mean that I won't do only text on any platform. But the majority of what we post on each platform is considered best practice for that platform. We try to really think, okay, what is is performing the best on Instagram? Mm -hmm. When people get on Instagram, what are they expecting to see? Stills, still. Now you can put in videos every so often, but you know, stills are still gonna perform best and it's still what people mostly expect. And so you've gotta figure out how can we be different? There's no merit or benefit that I see from posting the exact same thing on every single platform. Not only does that kind of teach the people within your audience to not really care about what you're posting on a single platform, because let's say they follow you on both Instagram and Facebook and they see something on Facebook, maybe they'll think to themselves, and I would subconsciously, I don't really need to pay attention to this because I'll probably still see it on Instagram somewhere Mm, else. And now they just start to ignore you. That's what you don't want. And if you post the exact same stuff all the time, people are just gonna start to ignore what they're seeing from your channel, from your page, from your profile because they think to themselves, I've already seen this on Instagram. And even if they haven't, it's happened so many times that that's what you've conditioned them to do. That's how they are conditioned to respond. It's true. I've unfollowed so many people who like repost their photos from Instagram to Facebook because I'm like, uh, now I've liked your photo in two places. I don't want to do that. <laughs> and reposting automatically is possible. Even if you did it manually, still just as bad. So yeah. you need unique content. The point here is that you don't need to create something brand new every single day or multiple times a day for multiple platforms. There are so many variables that you're working with to mix things up. So for instance, we'll, I'll take this single idea. And usually how I do it for Pro Church Tools is I come in on Monday morning and I'm writing two videos for that week. We've got a podcast that's going live. We've got another podcast that's going live and we've got Ask Brady. So from the week before, I'll look at Ask Brady and I'll try to create like a one by one video that, you know, something that I shared that was cool that I, I can take into put into 60 seconds. And I put that on Instagram and I put that on Facebook. And then what I'll try to do, and I'll schedule those on different days, and I'll caption them a bit differently. And you know, Instagram does not allow captions yet, but Facebook does, and so I'll kind of prepare them differently. And then I'll take kind of the big ideas from the videos that I've written, and I'll take 140 character blurbs, and I'll put them into the Twitter stream. And I'll take kind of the best quotes, and I'll create some quote posts for Instagram. And we'll take the video as a whole that we record that day and we'll put it entirely on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So the subject matter there is remaining the same, but I'm adjusting other variables. Length, medium, time of day that's posted. Same subject matter, we're adjusting other variables. You could adjust subject matter every single time, but the point is that you've got all these variables, infinite possibilities. The worst thing that you can do is keep everything the same. There's no reason for you to. So look at the variables from your standpoint that are the easiest to adjust. The ones that are gonna require the least amount of effort, creative input, and time from you, but don't keep everything the same. Only bad can come from that. It doesn't have to be difficult. You can look at all these variables, mix and match, create that variety, create the contrast, keep people on their toes, don't condition them to ignore you by posting the same thing on every platform. And do you purposely, like if you're posting about the podcast, like whatever episode we do this week, would you purposely put your podcast out only on Instagram and then a couple days later do it on Facebook? Or would you post about the same subject on the same day on both places? That's a great, and that that, that was part of his question. So I'm glad you reminded me of that. Because what I did want to say is that the way that content works with podcasts, with articles, with videos, these aren't timely. 
You're not breaking news as a church. You're not like, oh, guess what Donald Trump Jr. posted now, which was a big right. thing that happened this week. Where you need to get it out if you're CNN, if you are Fox News, if you are the New York Times, the one that was going to break the story. And you need to get that out on every single social platform because it is very timely. That's not the way that your type of content as a church works. I mean, maybe because of the service that was most recent, but even that, like, unless you're talking extremely about current events, someone could watch that same sermon a year later, and Furtick does this all the time, where he'll release kind of sermons of old, and you'll know because he's way skinnier, and <laughs> and that content is still just as good. That sermon yeah. is still just as good. So there's no reason for you to think, this podcast was live today, I need to send it out. I used to do this. I used to post a podcast on a Tuesday and be like, we gotta email people on Tuesday, we gotta post about it on social on Tuesday. Now what I'll do is I'll just catch up a week later because people that are subscribed to the podcast, they'll get it right away and maybe we'll send out an email a couple of days later, but you're not breaking news. And so there's no reason for things to be incredibly timely. Post about it the day later, post about it a week later, Post about it a month later. We have our Twitter queue set up and even the way that we stru structure our YouTube channel where we post like and, and, and kind of show the posts that we think are most valuable even a month later. But even in Twitter, I set things up on a recurring basis using a tool called, uh, called Smarter Queue where I have now close to 300 tweets that I think are very good, have performed well, and they just endlessly cycle. There's so many of them that people rarely see the same ones twice. Or if they do see the same ones twice, it's still so good that they like it or retweet it. But for the majority of the audience, they don't even see things duplicate multiple times. Mm -hmm. And we just have them on a recurring basis. The same 50 articles that we love sending out over and over and over again because the timeliness just isn't there. So don't kind of buy into that lie that we've got breaking news and we need to post it. We, we released a podcast. It needs to go out today. If there is a timely element to what you're posting, like if you have a a weekday podcast. Some churches do this, you know, a new podcast. It's like a five minute current events one that goes out every single day at 8 a.m. Yeah, then maybe that would be a little bit different. But the majority of church content isn't timely to the extent that it needs to be posted right now because if we don't, right. the thing that we've got going for this content, that which it is timely, will be lost. Just not the case. Yeah. Well, those are the four questions. A little bit longer of an episode today, uh, which means I, I didn't even have a coffee. I was just a little bit hyped up, I guess, extra. So thanks so much for listening or watching. If you want your question answered, you can hashtag Ask Brady on Twitter and Instagram, wherever. We'll find it. If you're on YouTube or Facebook, put your question, hashtag Ask Brady in the comments below. If you have a video question, do know that if you send it in, just as Jared and Adam did in this episode, you'll be sent immediately to the top of the queue. Jared sent in his question when? Uh, last Friday, I think. Last Friday. You know how many questions that Jared leapfrogged? All of them, because he <laughs> sent in a video. If you want your question answered immediately, send in a video, and you'll be pushed immediately to the top of the queue. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. 